Jesus. Hallelujah. We give thanks to the Heavenly Father. And we do so by the name of his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. And uh, Heavenly Father, we come before you and we pray, Father, that your goodness and your mercies will continue to follow after us. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that, Father, your anointing will be here uh, to teach us. We pray, Father, that uh, every ears that are on this platform will hear your words being spoken unto them. We pray, Father, that you will reveal your truth unto us so that we can walk according to your words. And we pray, Heavenly Father, upon uh, the presenter, the speaker, O oh God, that you give him words of wisdom, words of gentleness, words of instructions, O oh God, so that we would know your words. And we pray even for the moderators. We pray for every song that is sung. Uh, we ask that your hands may be upon um, the, the, the readers, O oh God, the speakers. O oh God, everyone who is participating, we pray that it will be to your glory. And we ask all these things by the name of your only begotten son, Christ Jesus, all to the glory of the heavenly father. Amen. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brother Jeffrey, for prayer. We give God thanks. So we know he said that we should acknowledge him in all we do. And we know for sure that he will do his part as long as we are faithful in doing our part. We don't have to question whether or not God is faithful. He is faithful beyond even what we can think or imagine. So we give God thanks for prayer. We saw Pastor Link came on, but he... Um, get off back so we trust that he will um, resume as quick as possible because we're just going to go right into our night study. Uh, Evangelist Simmons, are you here possible to do a song for us as Pastor Ling? Pastor Corey, he's there now. He's there now? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's two screen. Oh, so I'm not. Okay. All right. Thank you, Sister Jackie. Thank you so You're much. Welcome. All right. So tonight again, I want to say welcome, everyone. Welcome, 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 welcome to this another uh, Bible study coming to you from the Church of God, Sabbath keeping here in Ottawa. We give God thanks for the brethren, the faithful brethren and the faithful team that are working hard in maintaining this ministry over the years. And so we just pray that God will continue to bless us all as we continue to teach the word of God. Amen. Teach the word of God. If you notice, I said the word of God, because nothing else we teach but the truth of God. And that is the word of God. And so before uh, any further ado, I'm going to ask Sister Jackie at this time to introduce our presenter and teacher for the night in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Corey. It's indeed a pleasure once again to introduce our speaker for tonight and for the rest of the month of April. He's no stranger to our platform. Actually, he presented last year and he has always supported us. He has been living and working in the Cayman Islands for 21 years and has served as chairman of the church board for 20 years. He was ordained pastor in 2019. Our presenter has taught mathematics for more than 40 years at the secondary and tertiary levels and physics at the secondary level. He has been married to Sister Norma Lang for 37 years and is the father of two children, Caron, their son, and Sashin, their daughter. Our presenter is passionate about studying, understanding, and sharing the word of God. Please join me in welcoming Pastor Kedroy Lang to the platform. Receive him in Jesus' name. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Thank you, Sister Jackie. Sorry yeah, for <laughs> I've been sitting here all evening waiting for the time to come. <laughs> I just logged in a while ago, got kicked out again. But there's backup 
<laughs> All right, greetings, everyone. Praise the Lord. Greetings, greetings. Uh, greetings. 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 Praise the Lord. What? All right, my, my topic this evening and for the next couple of weeks, I don't think it should be very, very challenging. So I expect we will have good participation and we will be better off from engaging during this time than when we started. I want to thank Pastor Quarry and, and company for extending this invitation the second time around. The time is very tough for me now and it's hard to fit in, but I'll, I'll make the best use of the opportunity because God's people really need to engage in the word of God, especially in these times that we're living now. We're living in very challenging times and we have to have our focus kingdom work. So the topic, as you have heard, I would have read, is a vessel of reconciliation, the power of forgiveness. And we aim to do this in three different segments. The last segment will have three sub-segments. The first encounter is going to be why reconciliation is necessary. Now, you can't read the Bible without encountering a lot of re. We have reconciliation, we have restoration, we have redemption, we have repentance, a lot of re's. But all of those are really encapsulated in this concept of reconciliation. So what is it? So we're going to tackle that first, and then we're going to see how the vessel fits into this idea and the role that forgiveness plays in reconciliation. Now, the banking people have some idea of what reconciliation is about. They have what is called a bank reconciliation statement, but we're not, we don't want to go there this evening. We want to focus on reconciliation in the biblical context. And we want to zero in on what God himself is seeking to do and has brought about through the work of Jesus Christ. So a broad perspective of reconciliation, we could look at it from a different number of standpoints. Reconciliation can be regarded as the restoration of friendly relations. It can be regarded as the action of making one view or belief compatible with another. Like when people are in disagreement or they have divergent views, then sometimes they try to find a common ground where one view can be reconciled with the other. Reconciliation in a broader context can be looked at as the results of the atonement that is God seeking to bring harmony between himself and man. There is an element of peace also in reconciliation. It can be looked at as peace between humanity and God that results from the redemptive work of Christ. In fact, the Bible refers to Jesus as our peace. Usually in bringing about reconciliation, someone usually plays a mediatory role and Jesus Christ actually fits into that mold quite perfectly in some context. And then this is the broad or the broadest view that we're going to take. It is the act of God 
that brings man back together with him. And that is very important. It is the act of God that brings man back together with him. God is the author and Jesus is the agent and us who are here this evening along with others are ambassadors of reconciliation. Right, so that is the gr groundwork or the framework in which this discussion is going to be set. So why is reconciliation necessary? Sorry. Yeah, reconciliation is needed between God and man in the first instance, between man and his fellow man, between man and creation. And man needs to be reconciled with himself because man somehow, as a result of his disconnection from God, somehow has lost his own concept of himself. So man needs to come to grips with who he really is. And some people, even as we speak, are grappling with who they really are. So there is a need for reconciliation on multiple fronts. But it all starts with man being reconciled with God. Now we know what caused reconciliation to be necessary. It's captured in Genesis chapter three, a story that we all are familiar with. And everything that we are engaging in from a scriptural, our spiritual perspective have their foundation in that Genesis 3 episode. I'd like this jacket to read for me Genesis 3 from verses 8 to 11. It reads, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. Verse 11. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree, whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? All right, so, so this is just part of the entire episode. Man was given strict instructions by God how he should relate to God. And there are two trees that symbolize whether man would stay in harmony with God or he would seek his own independence and become at enmity with God. We know this story of it unfolded. Here we find man, instead of going to meet God, is going away from God because he has taken a route that God had instructed him not to take. And this is right where the relationship between God and man became broken. Reconciliation in this context results from a broken relationship 
first between God and man. And it has affected every other relationship that man is involved in ever since. This broken relationship between God and man also resulted in a broken relationship between man and creation. As you read this story, you see God telling man that it was going to be difficult for him to exist on earth. He was going to have it hard to work because the creation itself was going to pose a challenge to him. We also find the man blaming God, <laughs> true blaming the woman for his decision. So right there, we had this harmony. And let's pick it up in verses 17 to 19, Sister Jackie. It reads, and unto Adam he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Verse 18, thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Right, so here is creation actually at odds with man. Man is not going to have it easy. He is going to get resistance from the place where he was supposed to be getting his livelihood. Romans 8 tells us that the whole creation is groaning and travailing, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. The creation is actually waiting for the day when man will be at one with God again. And so the creation will be at rest. So the, the broken relationship between God and man has caused many other broken relationships and reconciliation is needed on all fronts. But it all starts with reconciliation between God and man. That's the first line of business. God himself, in reacting to what man did, also demonstrated the means by which this reconciliation was going to be achieved in the slaying of the animal, whatever it may be, and the covering of the man and the woman's nakedness with the skin of an animal, which is a figure of the atonement that was later to come. All right, so we're going to look at some of the evidence of that broken relationship that necessity <laughs> necessitated the need for reconciliation. Let's go to Isaiah chapter. Before we go there, in Genesis 4 and verse 8, please read that verse, Mr. Jack. Genesis 4 and verse 8. Brother Jeffrey, you could go ahead and read. So. Mm -hmm. Genesis, Genesis 4 and verse 8. eight. All right. Verse 8, yes. Uh, and Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. Right. So here we find another effect of that broken relationship between God and man. It resulted in broken relationship between two brothers. Cain and Abel are at odds with each other, resulting in Cain slaying his brother. 
it is very interesting that when Manzin, God asked him, what, what have you done? <laughs> because it seemed that they had no idea of the long-term consequences of their decision to go opposite to God's way. All right, we're going to look at some instances or some evidences of this broken relationship. Isaiah 53, verse 6. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 6 reads, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. All right, so, so is that the first part we want to look at in this case? Right, the, the second part of that verse speaks to God's own act in bringing about reconciliation. But we see the need for that in the first part of the verse. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. In other words, we have gone in the opposite direction to God. We are not thinking the way God thinks. We're not seeing the way God sees. And so the need for reconciliation is quite evident in this verse. Isaiah 50. 9 verse 2. Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 2. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. All right, so, so that is another symptom of our, our enmity with God. We have our sins have separated between us and God. So we cannot see things the way God does. We and God are not on the same page because man went in the opposite direction to what God had instructed him. And so the need for recreation beckons. Isaiah 55, verse 8. Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. Right. That is, and, and that, that sums up everything. Your ways are not my ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Now, just think about that for a minute. If we are not thinking the way God thinks, if we do not operate the way God operates, what kind of relationship can we really have with God? So it, it seems that this, the, the sound is getting louder and louder. Reconciliation is needed. So he says that we do not think like him. My thoughts are not your thoughts. In fact, he goes on to describe it in very colorful language. For as the heavens are higher than the eye above the earth, so are my thoughts <laughs> above your thoughts. So God says we, we are not on the same page with him. But God is not content for this condition to, to persist. He has his own intentions where this is concerned. In fact, we know from scripture that God, who has foreknowledge, saw all of this happening long, long before it happened. And he made provision for it. The beauty about this that it is God who has taken the initiative to bring about this 
reconciliation. And one of the things that sometimes we forget is that even some of the things that we find pleasure in and they seem so harmless, God does not look at them the same way. And it's captured in that verse. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Your ways are not my ways. And in the world in which we live, oftentimes people ascribe their behavior or their passions to God. And we, we don't seem to recognize that when man decided to go his own way, to take unto himself the knowledge of what is good and what is evil, he actually started to create his own world, his own sphere that we call the world. And we are told in one certain manner that if we love the world, we automatically become an enemy of God because the world's ways do not reflect God's thinking. The world's pleasures do not reflect God's pleasures. So a lot of time, like we music, we say, boy, like people, people have all kind of music that we try to bring all of them into the worship of God. Not mindful of the fact that it's not everything that man does is because of what God has done in man. Man took a form of independence to himself. And so man is seeking to give glory to himself rather than to God. And so a lot of things that he finds pleasure in, God thinks quite the opposite. I was trying to find the passage, but somebody might have it in their memory. It says, what is highly valued among men is detestable in the sight of God. It, it actually augments. First Corinthians? I'm sorry, Pastor. I'm not sure. I know it. I, I'm not. I don't know the exact passage where it is. But I said it actually augments what we what God said in Isaiah 55. Right? What we find pleasure in, God thinks quite the opposite of them. Now, in Amos 3 and verse 3, our total question is that Amos 3 verse 3. Amos chapter 3 and verse 3. Yes. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Right. So, and walking together, there is not a physical walk. <laughs> right? It is actually speaking about interaction. It's relational. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Second Corinthians 6 gives us some Indication of that too, where it talks about the temple of God being pitted against the temple of Belial. Light being pitted against darkness. They are in disharmony with each other. And so, if when God, if our ways are not God's ways, if our thoughts are not God's thoughts, then we cannot walk with God unless something happens. So when you read that Noah and Enoch walk with God, you must read it against the background that that was not normal. Because humanity on a whole have been at odds with God. Always are not God's ways, our thoughts are not his thoughts. All right, I'm going to cite two more scriptures 
And then if there's any question, we can take it at this juncture. Romans 3, 23. This is the New Testament we're in now. Continuing the need for reconciliation. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Right, and the glory of God is really captured in God's character. And so because we have become rebellious as a result of sin, because at its, at its basis, sin is really rebellion. Rebellion against God's law. And as a result of that, we do not reflect the character of God. And so we cannot be in harmony with him. And then Romans 8 verse 7 really gives us a sobering picture of it all. Romans chapter 8 and verse 7. Because yes. the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Right. So, so let's look at that for a little while. The carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God. Neither can it be? Let's think about that. Do we have any questions? Any raise hand there, Sister Jackie? No raised hands. Any input? Uh, we have a, yeah, we just have a comment in the chat. I think Sister Davidson, Miss Davidson was just put a comment in there regarding the word reconciliation. So I guess we can just read it personally or individually ourselves. Okay. All right. Good. <clears throat> But at its, in its broadest sense, it's wherever, there, wherever there is a need for reconciliation, there is always disagreement, right? Even in the accounting context, there is this disagreement between the bank balance and what the person who has the account has or the business. And so there is need for reconciliation. That's why they have bank reconciliation statements. But reconciliation is set in the context of disagreement. But the, the disagreement between God and man is not an ordinary disagreement. Going back to Romans 8-7, the, the, the sinful mind or the carnal mind is enmity. The NIV says it is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. So man is in a position that he cannot, he cannot by himself bring about reconciliation with God. And remember what we said that reconciliation with God is fundamental or it is a prerequisite for reconciliation between man and the rest of creation. The, the passage goes on to say in Romans 8 that those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. So we see the impossibility of man being in a wholesome relationship with God as a result of the path that he has taken. We have gone astray, all of us, and therefore reconciliation becomes necessary 
But I said, we have a dilemma because it will not happen from man's end because the mind of man cannot subject itself to God's law. It will not bring itself under God's government unless something happens. So we see where it is going to come from. We now it have one help. raised hand. Pastor Lang, if you are able. Sorry. Yeah, please, please go ahead. Okay. Sister Gooden, or you can go in. Hey. Good evening, Pastor Lang. I just want you to explain um, Romans 3, verse 23. And I'll mm -hmm. tell you why first. Because normally I um Christians um will quote this text to say no one can be perfect because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And maybe I need some clarity because I'm thinking that all need Jesus, all need um to accept the way that God has given for our um redemption so is it okay for someone who has accepted the the christ um the provision that god has made to continually say we well like we cannot be perfect because all have sinned and come short that's the <laughs> i i could answer it but it's going to, anyway it's going to take me <laughs> ahead of myself yeah. but just to say that anyone who is appropriating that type of meaning to the scripture is not doing justice. They are doing violence to the scripture in taking that approach. Remember, that is not a standalone version. You know, Paul is actually developing a thesis. And that is, that is sort of con a conclusion that he has come to based on what he has been saying before. So we're not supposed to be just reading that by self. I'm just putting, I just stated it in the context that we're looking at why reconciliation is actually needed. All right, let me read, let me quickly read Romans 3.21 down to 23 and 24. All right, let my readers do you that. Want me to read it? Okay, I got you, Pastor. So Go Romans ahead. 3 and verse 21, it says, yes. but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Right. So, so Paul, Paul was building an argument about the Jews relative to the Gentiles. He's talking about how salvation is possible. And he's saying, he's, if you read ahead, he's actually said that in, actually, in verse 10, he says that it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. And he continues along that line that the Jews really have no advantage over the Gentiles because by the works of the law, he says, no flesh is going to be justified. Now, remember that Man's dilemma, as we have said, that man could not bring himself back to God. He cannot by himself be reconciled to God. We have read a number of scriptures that point to the hopelessness that man finds himself in. The only way man is going to have hope is if the initiative comes 
towards him. He is not capable of bringing about reconciliation. He can't even initiate it by himself. So that is why the law was given to really bring us to Christ. It was supposed to bring us into a mold of obedience. But when Paul talks about the righteousness that comes by faith, right, in contrast to the righteousness of the law, he's talking about the works of the law. Verse 20 says, Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. So the law itself points us to the need for someone to rescue us from the dilemma that we find ourselves in. So all, all Paul is saying is that everybody, everybody has missed the mark and it is only corroborating what he says in verse 10 there is no one righteous not even one there is no one who understands no one who seeks god verse 12 all have turned away they have together become worthless there is no one who does good not even one and he's talking about both Jews and Gentiles. And he encapsulates that by saying, nobody is going to be justified in his sight. Right? Because all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So we cannot, by observing a law, find ourselves back in the right relationship with God. God has to do something with the carnal man to help him to start to think and act differently for reconciliation to take place. And if and the glory of God, I said, if we are rebels, nobody can look at us and see the character of God because we are actually acting in opposition to the way that God operates. We are the complete contrast of what God is. So the initiative for reconciliation has to come from God. And that is what Jesus was sent to earth to do. Right, but that is going to be developed further as we go along. Hope that has helped you, Sister Gooden. Thank you so much, sir. We have two more hands, Pastor Lang. Can we take them? Sure. Okay, so we have Miss Davidson first and then Pastor Corey. Miss Gooden, could you repeat what you just said to um Pastor Lang, please. This, this, I think you read something. If you don't mind. I read, um, sorry, sis. I read Romans 3 and verse 23, which was the text um, Pastor Lang gave us, one of the texts. But you said something about pleasing or something. You asked the question. What was the question that you asked? No, um, I said, um, she, may even, I, may I, sister, uh, she was asking why people use this scripture to make an excuse. And what was the scripture that she, she said? This one, Rom Romans 3.23. And what did Romans 3.23 said? Because I'm just trying to oh, that's ask fine. a question. I said, for all, thank for you. all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, guys. Um, so, um, Pastor Lang, you just mentioned, correct me if I'm wrong, that it's hard to please God if you're sinful. Um, she stated something and you said she stated it out of context. So, as 
based on what I've seen is that you're saying the same thing that she's saying. However, you said she's, it's out of context. So could you please put it in context for me so I can understand? Because she's, you said it's hard to please God if you're sinful. And basically that's what she's saying. So correct me if I'm wrong. So are you able to elaborate further regarding the context that it should be said in? Right before you go, no, Pastor. You. Oh. I, but I, okay, go no, ahead. I, I'm, I'm trying to get a, you know, a, no, I, I, an understanding of the context. Yeah, but I just want to let you know, uh, Sister Davidson, that Sister Gooden was asking if why the reason that people say that you can't be perfect. She she was just looking for the reasons why people like to use this scripture. And he said it's yeah. taken out of context. And my question to him is that why is it seen as taken out of context when you just stated that it's hard to please God if you're sinful? So I want to see how you present it to me within context. I'm not okay. saying she's wrong or right, but I want to see, well, you know, give it to me in context. Because basically to me, you were saying the same thing that she's saying. So I'm just, mm -hmm. I, I just, it's a teaching moment for me. No, what what is the a learning? Was, sorry, learning moment for me. Go ahead, please. No problem, man. No problem. No problem. That's fine. She was saying that some people use this as an excuse, like mm -hmm. you cannot live to please God in a sense because all have sinned. Mm -hmm. That is the context that is the good put it in. So mm -hmm. people use it as an excuse for sin. Am I saying it right, is the good? Yes, sir. Right. And I said, that is what I was saying. That, that is what I got from what you were saying. That people, mm -hmm. that it, it is similar to people saying that nobody can keep the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. It is that context. So let me, let me break it. Let me bring it home to, you know. He says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I said, that is we, we cannot take that away from what Paul is saying. We have to follow what he's saying right from chapter one, right down to this section. He's building a case, right? Because you have this conflict between the Jews and the Gentiles. And Paul is saying that if you read above, he says, we have concluded verse nine. He says, what shall we conclude then? Are we better than they? That is Jews. Are Jews better than Gentiles? Not at all. We have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under sin. Mm -hmm. Are you with me? Yes, I'm listening. Right. So, and then he goes on to say, he says that verse 20, therefore no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. Mm -hmm. So he's so he's building an argument. And when he comes down to this junction now, he says that we all, sorry, the right, verse 22 says, the righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Notice the all again. Mm -hmm. There is no difference. What difference? There's no difference between the Jews and the Gentiles, between those who depend on the law for their righteousness and those who don't, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I won't, let, me, let me not stop there because he didn't stop. And he said, and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption. So what he's, there, he's doing is describing the position that all of humanity finds themselves in. And the solution to all of humanity's problem, where sin is concerned, is in Jesus Christ. Um, thank you for the information. I've, I found myself doing the same thing occasionally because sometimes you deal with, you know, some people, whether they're Christian or not, and they tend to have this perfection um, attitude and I would say let he without sins cast the first stone am I making an excuse for what I'm doing not necessarily I'm just saying to the person okay I know I'm wrong but don't act like you're perfect so you know 
is it an excuse? It depends. Sometimes it's using excuses. Sometimes it, it, it check the other person that is saying, oh, by the way, this is what you're doing. You're saying, I'm not perfect. God said we're not perfect. So, you know what I mean? So I just thought I should mention that, you know, let he without sin yeah, cast the yeah. first stone. Yeah, that, that word, I know, I know we're not, you see, what we're not supposed to do, we're not supposed to put people down, right? Yes. Because if you are putting somebody down, you are mm -hmm. automatically elevating yourself. Mm -hmm. so, so that is from that perspective. But on the other hand, we, we are not to like what Sister Goodman say, because this is what a lot of folks do. A lot of folks do not press toward the mark of the high calling, as Paul would say. A lot of folks do not resist temptation as they should because of the same thing that boy we are never going to be there but perfection from god's perspective is not perfection from our perspective most time we see perfection in the bible it's about being complete doing what god expects of us like a perfect man is not a man who does not sin you know but a perfect man will have the same mindset towards him that God does. He will, when he finds himself committing sin, he's going to be unhappy about it, just like God is unhappy. It does not mean that he's not going to falter because we have not yet developed so that we can walk without any fault or flaw whatsoever. But the golden rule for me is that we never put people down because once we do that, we automatically elevate ourselves above them. And somebody said the ground is level at the foot of the cross. Amen. All right. Sorry, Pastor Quarry, for keeping you so long. Go ahead, Pastor Quarry. Thank you, Pastor Lane. Thank you. I'm, I'm just here to support you. Um, to put some more weight on, on what you, you said, because, um, and to let Sister Gooden also know um, that this verse used out of context when person use it like that, because as you said here, Paul was teaching about the remedy, which we're looking at now, right? Jesus Christ, and so there was a conflict between Jews and Gentiles, you know, whether or not who is righteous from who is not righteous. And so they are, here Paul is presenting it that whether you think you keep the law or whether you think you don't keep the law or not, the fact is that Jesus Christ is a remedy, right? So you don't have no excuse. We all sin, ED. So it is not talking about we who have accepted Jesus Christ now and living for the Lord that we're going to use it to say that we can't live or we can't be at the place where God wants us to be. Here, Paul was just presenting the remedy and the two occasion that there is no other reason or source that one can be free from them sin, except them accept Jesus Christ. Right. Because that is, that is, the, only, that is the only remedy that God has for man. That is the only way man is going to get back on the same page with God. And, and I said, this matter of sin is something that I think we don't, we don't truly spend time to understand because different people have their own definition of what sin is. And sin is a serious matter from God's perspective. You see how God had to deal with sin. He had to send his son to suffer and to die, to be abused, to deal with sin. So sin is not a, sin is not an ordinary matter. Since, since the Macintosh, I heard you said something, and I want to, it's very important that I clarify it a little. You said, I said that it was hard for a sinner to please God, right? It's not hard. It is impossible. The Bible says that it is impossible. Because we, we are by nature rebels. 
The carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God. Neither can it be. And, and the thing is, verse 9 says, those, those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. For us to please God, we have to come out of the flesh and we can take ourselves out. Only the grace of God can do that for us. All right, that's it. Any other hand? Any other comment? No more hands for now, Pastor Lang. Okay. All right, so, so, we, so we have looked at why reconciliation is needed. And we are going to look at how God goes about bringing that reconciliation. Now remember, it's very important that we understand that, you know, that no, none of us can bring ourselves to God. Our nature does not allow us to do it. In the same passage, Paul says, there is none that seeketh after God, not even one. It is God who is always seeking after us. In fact, in the earliest episode that we, we referenced in Genesis 3, remember that after man rebelled against God's instruction and sin, that it was man who was running away from God. The man never ran to God. God came looking for him. And it has been that way ever since. Man has been going the wrong way. And that is why man needs to turn. That is why repentance is a part of the reconciliation process. Because man is going in the opposite direction. Your ways are not my ways. God goes east, man goes west. God goes north, man goes south. And he's not going to be able to bring himself around by himself. He needs supernatural help. And that is what reconciliation is all about. God taking it upon himself to bring about harmony between himself and man. So, why reconciliation is needed again? Let's go to let's go to Matthew chapter six and verse ten. Matthew six, verse ten. Uh, Matthew chapter six and verse ten. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. All right. Now that verse, that single verse that you have there. That verse has a lot of power in it. That verse captures so much of the Bible. <laughs> you might not even imagine. Now, I'm going to look at two things that Jesus did. In John 6 and verse 38, you don't have to return here. You can trust me on this one. For I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Right? That's what Jesus said he came to do. He came down from heaven, not to do his own will, but the will of the Father who sent him. Now, when he came, after his temptation in the wilderness, he came preaching, right? Did he? And what were his first utterances? 
repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You see the connection between those two verses and Matthew 6 verse 10? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Without reconciliation between God and man, this cannot happen. Sin, I say, is rebellion against God's law. Therefore, God cannot rule over man in the state that man is. If God does not rule over man, then God's will cannot be done on earth. When God put man on earth, he made man in his own image and after his likeness because he wanted earth to be governed by the same principles as heaven. For that to happen, man would have to submit to God's government. When man decided to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that could not happen. In fact, if Adam and Eve did not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and in a sense, what did we say now? They actually asserted their own independence from God. Because if you go back and read it, God said to, I think it was the cherubim, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. In other words, he has become independent of us. So let us take away the tree of life. Right? So man, man was basically on his own. He was charting his own course. And we see them first discovering by themselves that they were naked, finding their own solution to their own nakedness by making fig leaves. But Jesus, when the fullness of time was come, then God's reconciliation plan would start to take effect. That's why we refer to the things in the Old Testament as types and shadows. But the substance is actually in Christ. So back to this. Verse, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. All that God desires here rests on man being reconciled to him. Without reconciliation, God cannot rule man. And God's will cannot be done if man's will is not brought in subjection to his. Any comments here? Uh, I have a question. Sister Davis, oh, Sister Davis oh. has her finger up. Okay. Guys, Sister Davis. So. Um, could you repeat what you said about the rule, please? They, Could you repeat that rule. statement? Yes. Could you please? Wait, right. So I said, if, if God's will is going to be done on earth, then God must rule over man. Okay. Because I thought you said God cannot rule man. You said must. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks for your participation and your alertness. And, and, um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so, oh, sorry. <laughs> Good save. <laughs> oh, oh, um, can I, can I ask a question? Can I make a point here? Pastor, ahead, Pastor Wallace. Thank you so much. Greetings um, to you all. I had a previous meeting, so I came in late. Um, just to kind of concur with you, Pastor Leng, and just to add this, 
that this, this rulership, though God is sovereign, the rulership that he, he needs to have over mankind is, is something that we have to voluntarily give to him because he will not force his will on us to do because, because we're free agent. Mm -hmm. Then we allow to either surrender to him or we surrender to the, to the way of the world. It, 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 it must be a desire. It must be intentional on our part to have God be our ruler. He will not force his will on us. So I just want to support you on that, Pastor Lynn. Thank you, Pastor Wallace. That's the only answer, Jackie? Yes. So I'll ask a question, and then we have one raised hand, Brother Paul. But my question kind of goes back to something you said earlier. Mm -hmm. Um. So I wanted to ask, is reconciliation, and again, I don't know if you'll come to that later, but is reconciliation a one-time event? Does it happen automatically when we accept Christ, or is it a process? Because earlier you mentioned something about it involves repentance as well. Brilliant. That's a brilliant question, Mr. Jackie. Thank you for it. Right? Mm. right. Because I, I intended to bring it in, but since you brought it out, that's very wonderful. Okay. Reconciliation. Like they, if we go to Second Corinthians five, which which is going to be pivotal as we go along, right? We're going to go back to it. So let me let me see somebody provoked it earlier on. So let me go there now. Second Corinthians five, eighteen to twenty. I have it. It reads yes. yes. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us we pray you in Christ's stead be ye reconciled to God for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. All right. So let me take Sister Jackie's question. So reconciliation, Sister Jackie, mm -hmm. I think that's, that's in those four verses, you'll find it about four times there. Reconciliation is an act of God. So God that is what all of what God is doing. We talk, we talk about redemption. We talk about justification, sanctification. All of that can fit into God's mission on earth. God's mission is reconciliation between the planet and himself. The planet is out of sync. It's not only man. It's out. The animals didn't do anything. But I said, when man <laughs> fell out of harmony with God, everything suffers. Because earth was put on the man's domain. And when his relationship with God became sour, everything that man interacts with suffers as a result. That's why Romans 8 depict the earth as being groaning, the whole creation groaning. Even the animals are suffering. We have animals have to be eating things that they were not designed to eat because man has messed up their habitat. Mm. A man running away from animals because of the hostility that we have created. So reconciliation can be a one-time act, but it is also a process. And we know it's a process because God actually through Christ, and you notice that when Christ came, Christ had to do a lot of things first mm -hmm. before he actually died. But by, by his act, by his act of crucifixion, he actually appeased God's wrath. And we're going to look at propitiation later on. So God was fully satisfied that man's rebellion was dealt with satisfactorily through the death of his son. Mm -hmm. So that brought about reconciliation between God and the planet. God can now enter into a different relationship with planet Earth. Notice Jesus died for the 
whole world. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Now, that does not happen all at once. And we see, right, most of humanity now has not been reconciled to God personally. So, if you want to say globally or universally, yes, God is not at war with our... Well, God has never been at war. <laughs> God does not see the world as enemy, so to speak. God has been satisfied by the death of his son to deal with earth in a different way. So that God has finished that part. But the process of bringing each of us in harmony with his will is continuing. So there is a process. So reconciliation is also a goal, but it is also a process. In the beginning, sorry, in the end, God's intention is that all of us will be at peace with him, with each other, and with nature. Amen. All right. Thank you, Good. sir. All right. Good. Yeah, so we have Brother Paul. Right, now. So, so we need, you know, in our interpersonal relationships, we need to do that too. We need to understand that. Amen. Yes, that a process is involved. And we're going to deal with them later on when we look at vessels, a vessel of reconciliation, right? But we want to get reconciliation right first, and then we'll be able to sail smoothly after that. So any, any little things we want to iron them up now so that we know the platform and which we are going to build all of our discussion later on. Right? And three weeks we know go fast. Okay, that's it. Anybody else? Yes, we do. We have Brother Paul. Wait, Brother Paul. Yes, sir. Thank you, Pastor Lang. Um, as um as free agent. Yes. Um and um and reconciliation come. So if we are free, so we don't need re reconcilia reconciliation, sir, because we are free agent. Mm. Mm. What do you understand by being free, Brother Paul? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> because um, Jesus died for us, sir. Mm. So that set us free. Free? Mm -hmm. To do what? Yes. Continue. Okay, I, continue. I let, me, continue. Okay. I let me help you. All right. Yes, sir. If you go to Romans 6, right, it will tell you. It describes who we were. It, it describes the dilemma that we were in before Christ came, okay? So we are now, before Christ came, we were tied to our carnal nature, unable to lose ourselves. This is, this is what Christ has done for us. He has, we're, we're also, not only that, we're also held captive because remember that sin has consequences. So we, we were actually condemned Wow. Not a guilty, but we were under condemnation. We were spiritually on death row. Agree? Are you with me, Brother Paul? Yes, sir. I agree with you. 100. <laughs> the freedom, the freedom that we have gotten is that we are no longer on death row. We can walk out of the prison of sin without the law coming down on us. Oh. Well, we have not lost. So, so here's, here's what I'm not. So now, this is what Paul asked in Romans 6. One, are we going to continue in sin? Because there is plenty grace. Because it will be tantamount to going back in bondage when you have been made free. 
is is like you go to court. Let's say you are charged for some crime, drug. Let's say you were peddling drugs one day. You went to the court. They charge you, and somebody paid the fine for you, right? Mm -hmm. And the judge says your fine has been paid. You are free to go. Good. You have your freedom now. You know you have your freedom. The law set you free. They they're not going to arrest you for that drug crime again. What are you going to do with your freedom when you go? Are you going to go and get some more drugs again? <laughs> are you going to try to stay as far from it as possible? Right? Stay as far. Stay as far. Yes. And, and, and even the even the law that we say is corrupt and so on, they have some good things about them. You know, you know that mm -hmm. even now they have situations where the judge will not necessarily put a penal sentence on you. They will come, they, they will command you to go to a rehabilitation center and get yourself checked out. And they will monitor you to see mm. if you're trying to keep yourself free. So Christ has set us free. We are now free to find our way, to, to, to find our way back to the tree of life with Christ's help. That's the freedom we have. We have freedom to live righteously now. We mm. did not have to work because we were held in chains by sin. Got it? Thank you, sir. You're welcome. All right, so, so I said, what we're going to, yeah, we don't have a lot of, I think we have about 19 minutes in the past. Uh, sorry? Are we, how many minutes we have left past the quarry? Uh, well, you have up until 9.45, which would be 8.45 for you. All right, so all right, so I, I got about 18 minutes left. All right, thank you. Welcome. All right, so let's go back to what I said about Matthew 6. Because I said, in this verse here, it's full of me. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do we understand this, brethren? This is what God is aiming at. This is what God was aiming at when he made man and placed him on earth. He gave him dominion over the earth. But we, we will have known by now that if God's word or God's law does not dominate man, man cannot dominate earth. So when man took himself from under God's authority, he lost his dominion over earth. And so, instead of him calling lions and lions coming to him, he is running away from lions. He is even running away from lizards and cockroaches and so on because he lost his dominion. Notice that when Christ came, first of all, Christ said he came to earth, not to do his own will, but to do the will of the one who sent him. Do you believe that Adam had a different assignment from the one that Christ had? I'm talking about this one. To do God's will. Well, we would not say that Adam came from heaven. He was made from the earth. Paul says the first man is of the earth, earthy. Right? Second man is from heaven. Right? So, Adam was placed on earth not to do Adam's will but to do God's will. Are we all agreed on that? Mm -hmm. Right? Amen. So we, know, we know that Adam did not do God's will. Agreed? Agreed. Right. So, and I said, we, we, I want us in the prison. I want us to, if we're not there yet, I want us to get the big picture, because when you when you understand the big picture, the Bible is going to be so sweet that 
you won't want to put it down. Because Jesus came to undo what Adam failed to do. That is why he's called the second Adam. So Adam was placed on earth to fulfill God's will, but we know that he could not do it by himself. He needed Eve. But I always joke and ask the question, where was Eve when Adam was made? And I think you know the answer by now, right? Where was Eve? I just posted it, Pastor. I said, is he, she was in his ribs. <laughs> That's where he, Eve was in his ribs. Right? <laughs> so, uh, it is safe to say that Adam came to the earth pregnant. <laughs> yeah, you know, I heard Pastor make some comments that thought were strange earlier about feel like you're pregnant, but yeah, you might be right. <laughs> <laughs> right? But but listen, but he was not the only one, you know. <laughs> you know that Christ came to the earth pregnant too. <laughs> mm -hmm. Christ came to the earth pregnant with the second Eve. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right? You know that? <laughs> yeah. Yes. And that's why that's why when, when the soldiers saw him and he saw he was dead, he had to pierce his side because the woman had to come out. Mm. All right, anyway, yeah. let's not cool. let's, I just I just put that in. But back to this, I want us to meditate on it because it captures the essence of everything that God is seeking to do. I said reconciliation encapsulates all of it because it is both a product. And a, sorry, it's both a process and a goal. And we must understand that in our relationship too, that reconciliation is not a one act. But, but every process starts with something. It must have a starting point. Now, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I said, based on what we have said so far and the scripture that we have looked at, there is no way that verse can be fulfilled with the nature that man has. He cannot notice thy kingdom come. In other words, thy rule, thy authority, thy sovereign rule come on earth. Sorry, thy kingdom come, thy rule come to earth. And thy will be done because both of them must come together. His will is not going to be done unless he's ruling. His word must have authority, sovereign authority over earth for his will to be done on earth. But we already have read and established that the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God. It's not already can be ruled by God. And it will not submit to the rule of God. So we pose a challenge to God, which God alone was brave enough to take on. Hence, the entry of Jesus Christ into our world. So I said, if man remains hostile to God, he cannot perform God's will. And so God had to take the initiative. And that is what our study on this reconciliation is all about. How God has set about to bring healing between himself and man, and consequently between man and man, and man and the rest of creation. Man must experience a transformation. He must acquire a new nature that is no longer hostile to God. 
he must acquire a nature that will yield or submit to God's sovereign rule so that he can do on earth what God originally intended him to do. So when you think about thy kingdom come, by the way, do you think that that prayer would have been necessary if man never ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Would there be a need for such a prayer? I am asking a question now. I would say no. No. Can you repeat that the question, sir? Why is it? Would there be a need to pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, if man had not eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Have you heard it, Sister Gooden? I don't think so. <laughs> everybody will be doing his will. Right. Good. I said it is a failure of the second Adam that made the first. That, sorry, it was a failure of the first Adam that made the second Adam necessary. Remember why he came, you remember why he was called Jesus? Why was he called Jesus? In salvation. He shall save his people from there. Sin. Sin. Right. So if man never sinned, there'd be no need <laughs> for so, it is man's rebellion against God that made Jesus and reconciliation necessary. Any other thought? Uh, you know, Pastor, there is a hand up. Uh, hey, go ahead. I don't know. Sister P, if she, yeah, okay, she unmuted. Go ahead, Sister P. Yeah, good night, brethren. I have a good question night. based on what was said before. If man was, has accepted reconciliation with Christ, is he still a sinner? Would he still be considered a sinner? No. No. So no. when we pray in, or when we yes. talk generally, why do we call ourselves sinners? No, we shouldn't. We shouldn't. But at the same time, we should not forget where we're coming from. You understand? So that we don't get boasting. But God does not see us. By the way, I'm glad. It's a good question you asked it. What does the Bible say we are? Let's, uh, let's read. Let's remind ourselves of who we really are. Let's go to 1 John chapter 3. And we're going to read it. Verses 1 and 2. And possibly 3. Good question. 1 John chapter 3. Yes. And verses 1. It says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God, Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew not him, uh, knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And Take time and read that. Take time and read that. Right. Read it slowly, please. Beloved, I will. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And right. every... Okay, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead read that. Read that part. Okay. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. All right. Do I need to say anything more, sis? This for you, Sister P, I believe. Sister P. No, uh, no, we just have to be aware what the Bible says, that 
once we accept the reconciliation that Christ has now made for us, we should stop calling ourselves sinners. <laughs> yeah, because you see, and I said the reason why we are content to do that is because we don't we don't embrace the idea that sinners are really rebels. Sin is rebellion. And if we call, call ourselves sinners, we are actually saying we are rebels. And if rebelling against God, we cannot be reconciled to him. God does not see us from that perspective. Right now, and, and I like how John put it, now are we the sons of God. Right now, we are not fully developed yet. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. And here is, here is where a lot of us make serious mistakes. Because if we have not defined ourselves properly, we are going to be satisfied with mediocre living. The, by most of what the letters that Paul wrote and the Peter and other apostles, they wrote it to people who were called saints or believers. They did not write them to sinners. That's why you find Paul saying us and they and them. He says, we are the children of light. We were, not, we were in darkness, but now we are light in the Lord. Because what we believe we are does a lot to how we conduct ourselves. If we believe we are the children of God, and that is what John says, that every man who believes that when Christ appears, we are going to be like him, that person purifies himself or herself just as Jesus is pure. We live out who we think we are. Like I said, I tell my people that we must stay. We want to make it in. We are already in. What we must do is make sure that we don't step out. We have been included in Christ. We are in the family of God. Let us stay in there. Conduct ourselves so that we don't end up like people like Prince Andrew and so on. Yeah, we don't want to do that. We are belonging to a royal family of divine origin. Amen. Let us, live, let us live like that. Amen. That is, that is what God's reconciliation plan is all about. One day, when earth, when, sorry, this is for you, Mrs. Zadaki. When God's reconciliation plan is complete, mm -hmm. I mean, the goal has been reached. Earth will be just like heaven. Amen. Praise God. And I want to be around that time. <laughs> Amen. Don't, don't be present. Yeah, we also have to already have the principles of heaven in us so that when that, he heaven meets earth and earth join with heaven we are ready to live royalty with god that's right thank you very much that is why it says to be that we are called that's why god is looking for true worshipers mm -hmm. because unless we are worshiping in spirit and truth on earth we are misrepresenting what is happening in heaven. His only spirit and Jude worship takes place in heaven. Amen. God wants that same type of worship to be on earth because he wants to come and dwell here. Bless you, sir. 
Amen. Praise, praise the Lord. Lord. May God bless you, Pastor. Praise Paul. Praise. We will we will continue next week. God willing, right? We are going to look at this reconciliation in a deeper perspective. All right. Praise God. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, everyone, for your participation and your lively comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pastor Leng. God bless you to sir we really give god thanks for tonight um this topic and you know will sound new for some person but for some it's a reminder and it is very important and i give god thanks for the able way sir that you have dealt with the topic why reconciliation is necessary and so we give god thanks next week Amen. We will be looking at, you know, uh, another subtopic for next week, and that is the role of forgiveness in reconciliation. Very interesting. And so we would like to see everyone here and you bring someone with you and that will get, make it over 90 to 100 person on next week. God bless you and thank you so much. At this time, I'm going to ask uh pastor heard yes please to just close us in prayer and then we have pastor marshall do the benediction we bless the lord we bless the lord we bless the lord kind righteous love and eternal father we thank you this evening for your love your grace and your mercy towards us we thank you for the gift of salvation. Truly blessed Lord, we are glad that not only have you reconciled us unto yourself, yes. but you have given us the charge to go forth and allow others to see that you are still in the business of calling men back unto yourself. We're thankful this evening for the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, whom you have given to us, you have set in our hearts to guide us, to watch our steps day by day. Lord, we ask this evening as we give ourselves to you that all our power to be given to the Spirit and to the Word, that our behaviors, our actions, our thoughts, will come under the control of your words. The decisions that we make will be by your word so that you can be glorified. Again, we want to say thank you this evening for your word. We thank you for the teacher. We thank you for the able way, blessed Lord, that you are allowing him to give us a depth of understanding. Blessed be your great name. Why it is so important Amen. That we be reconciled unto you, Amen. not only by saving grace, but by our agreement with your words. Oh, blessed be your great name. So we will walk, blessed Jesus, continually in humbleness, in, in, in obedience, that you can be glorified. We want to thank you again this evening, Lord, that you are still the God that sits low, sits high and look low. And even now you see all that is happening, blessed Father, upon this oh earth. God. Your saints, those whom you have called, you have put your stamp upon us, blessed Lord. And there are our brothers and our sisters who are suffering, our brothers and our sisters, blessed Lord, who are in the war-torn country. Amen. We ask this evening, Lord, that you will be with them. We ask that you would supply their needs. Be merciful, O oh God, so that blessed be your great name. Hallelujah. You will be glorified in all places of the earth. For your name's sake, we pray and we thank you, blessed Lord, for your intervention in the affairs of man. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. Praise, Praise, God. Praise, Praise God. God. Praise Amen. God. Praise, Praise, God. God. Praise God. Praise God. Bless you. Praise Bless you, God. sir. Pastor Marshall. Thank you very much, Pastor Quarry. And now may the saving grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, the Father, the full fellowship of the Holy Communion, may you remain, rest, and abide with us now and forevermore. The church of the living God shall praise God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God.